And, and so for part two, I want to talk about marketplace and house. And this is something that I really have been thinking for a long, long time. I remember when we first get into the new move and we have some, um, we have some religion mountains, apostles really helping us. You know, those days, Apostle Michelle and myself, we are really fully marketplace people. We, we have no intention of doing church or things like that. So we began to talk to these leaders. And of course, they are very established uh, leaders in religion mountain. And you know, so many, you know, so many of the apostolic leaders really come from nuclear church background. They are not marketplace people. So when they think about equipping, when they talk about helping people to grow, they really just come from that religion mountain perspective. And I remember very, very early on, it was in Apostle Michel's office, I remember. And I, I, I say, would it, would, would it come a time where the equipping can actually come from marketplace people? And everyone is like, hmm, 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 not sure, not sure. And, and that's always been at the back of my mind for the last 10, 15 years. And interestingly, in the Bible, you can see such model. But anyway, that's not what I'm going to teach today, okay? Maybe part three. But today I want to talk really about sphere and where you are supposed to do. Because we are not supposed to do everything, right? And some of us are really cold into marketplace action. You do a lot of things in marketplace. But other people, not so much. We are called to equip. And I was just recently looking at my own redemptive prophecy. And there's a portion, actually, I used to think about it for a while. Then I just kind of... You know, sometimes you look at the word, then you're like, okay, just, just let it be. Just let it be. It, it will manifest by itself. And one of the words is like, it, it, it's a very interesting word. It said that at some point, I will be doing, and the word they use is full-time apostolic work. I'm like, full-time apostolic work. And you know, if you use a traditional mindset, then you think about you becoming full-time. But we know that's not the way of God. So what does it mean? And really, I, I feel you are going to have people that your major gift is marketplace, but not so much marketplace ministry, but marketplace equipping. So there is a difference. So some people, yeah, you have a job, you get salary, but your main gift is to raise up people in the house. Possible. But you can have the other way around also. You're supposed to go there, make money, join government, join education, whatever. So the whole purpose for this part is really an introduction cause us to begin to think, okay? All right, so let, let's look at the, the plan series. We already did part one. We look at uh, redemptive prophecy for Israel. Very interesting teaching. I mean, I didn't even realize that. Now, do you realize that when, when the first time they talk about war, right? Joshua was the one leading war, right? And it was 38 years after they fell at Kadesh Barnea. So it's very interesting that I suddenly realized, hey, this Joshua was never involved in house assignment. He, he didn't help in the tabernacle. He didn't help in the worship. He didn't help in prayer. He just helped in fighting. He is purely a marketplace person. Very interesting. And, but that, that's what we're talking about here. We want to talk about the, the sphere, the tension, and, and how we resolve it. Of course, part three, we want to talk about nations, okay? Now, very quickly, I just want to kind of give a few keywords because when we talk about activation of redemptive prophecy, a few concepts, just one-liner, you know, nothing complicated for, for us to kind of remember and process. Of course, the first thing is there has to be grace and faith. God provides a grace, we apply the faith. Because this caused the whole redemptive prophecy to be a cooperative nature. That means we have to work with God. By the way, do you know that God cannot force us? Do you know that? By the way, you cannot force human also. And even you force them, they'll be like, okay, okay. Even your children, right? You try to force them, right? They'll say, yeah, 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 yeah. But then, you know, when the heart is not there, it's like, yeah, so, so that, that's why it, you, we need to come to a place where people need to want to cooperate. Then, of course, we talk about the activation. Activation is really, yes, it's the application of faith. But one of the things that is very important for activation is there needs to be a personal awakening. And that's why sometimes people just need a touch from God and suddenly they are shifted. So that's why today we are hoping we can do a bit of activation. Because sometimes you just need a touch of God. We, we are just facilitator, nothing more, nothing more. Then, of course, we had to talk about kingdom advancement because this is really important. We, we talk about the three levels of kingdom advancement. You start with personal, right? And then you, you go into tribe, church, then you go into kingdom. Now, this is important because when you need 
to consider whether you are more marketplace ministry or you are more marketplace equipping, you have to see that which of your gifts have more impact in kingdom. For example, you could be a marketplace ministry, you have a business, but the, the benefit is really for yourself. That means in terms of kingdom advancement is at personal level. Then you could be equipping people and people are going out, prophetic evangelists and things like that and they impact nation. Then your gift is more at kingdom level. Do you know what I'm trying to say or not? So that's why you have to see. Now, it is not easy. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. This is not an easy... I was thinking for a long time before I even come up. And this is just introduction, okay? And so, you know, like, by the way, some people ask me, how, how long it takes for you to do one teaching? On average, six to eight hours. Six to eight hours. And this one I've been thinking for 10 years, okay? And so, so it's just something that I, I think God is going to give a personal revelation. And what we're trying to do here is just a template for you to consider. Then, of course, there has to be progress of growth because when you start to move into this, our mind, our hands have to upgrade. Just now you hear the testimony, right? The labor-intensive job, but then can, you can get more for less. That means your competency level is very high. And, and you know, I talk about really very, very skillful people. You know, some of you know I, I have an interest in collecting guitar and things like that. So there's one guy, of course, my, my long-time luthier, he has been in the industry for 40 years. So he could, like for example, one of the hardest instruments to make is the arch top, okay? So you have to arch the whole thing. If you ask a newbie maker, even with five to 10 years experience, they would take maybe four or five days to arch the whole thing. So for, for this guy, half an hour. And the quality is better. And he doesn't even need to measure because the intuition is there, the experience is there. He just see the word, he knows how deep. So, so this is growth. This is progress. And, and I mean, you know that right? whatever field you are in, right? I, I mean, I just think about I'm in, in legal line. You know, year one, if I'm in legal work, do one document, maybe five hours. Now it's like five minutes done. Same document. So we have to see progress of growth in whatever area we're called. Tipping point. It's a critical moment. See, we all, we, God will give us a tipping point. Nations have tipping point. That means we have to choose. I mean, right now, you, you look at the religious racial tension. We, we are at a tipping point again. Malaysia is going through many, many tipping points. So look at Israel. They had a tipping point at Meribah, right? Second time, no water. And there was a time the scriptures say, finally, they acknowledge God. After 38 years of struggle, they say, finally, we accept. We, we accept that you are God. Then, of course, spiritual warfare. We can't occupy, we can't go into our promised land without warfare. And we're not talking about low level. We're not talking about medium level. We're talking about high level warfare. So these are the key words. Just uh, keep at the back of your mind, they will help us in terms of activation of redemptive prophecy. All right, so we talked about this already last week, cooperating nature, and uh, you know, it's really where to do activation, we have to be obedient. I mean, when God says something, you have to be obedient, right? There's, there's no shortcut to that, right? Warfare, yes, we have to do processing, not just spiritual. Some people kind of throw out their brains, so the natural processing is not there. So we need that. Alignment is very important. You have to find the anointing that helps you. Sphere, you, you know your sphere, but when you are fruitful, when you are faithful, God expands your territory. And, and that's what happened with Israel. And then prove to be acceptable. That's what Apostle Paul said, right? You, you, want, to be, you want to make yourself acceptable in the presence of God. So that's the, the holiness journey. So this is all the things that require us to cooperate with God. Now, very quickly, I just want to uh, show you the, the levels. And uh, we mentioned this many times already, but just very quickly, you know, when we talk about personal, we're talking about personal level, level personal benefit. We do spiritual warfare at ground level. So time to succeed is ground level, but it's very important without that kind of warfare, you can't go to the next level. Uh, so it's so interesting that we can do deliverance now through phone. Remote. So it's a, it's a new advancement in growth, right? So we have personal overcoming, personal success. That's great, right? But a lot of people stop here. We shouldn't stop here. We have to go to the next one. Next one, of course, is church or tribe. And then you start to see corporate benefit. When we do things together, we all benefit, right? When someone is doing well for the body of Christ, we all benefit, right? So if somebody had a great testimony, we all benefit. And, and we are able to deal with occult level organized level. Then we start to see reformation, but reformation within the religion mountain, not quite other parts of seven mountain. 
And this is the one that we are looking for. We start to go into the seven mountains. We are dealing with strong men. We are dealing with strong men over the region. So when you look at Malaysia, for example, there are many, many strong men out there. And then, of course, the result is we can cause a nation to be disciple. It will become sheep and not goat. All right, with this, let me quickly talk about marketplace paradigm. If you've been here for a while, you know, from time to time, we'll teach marketplace. And there are many books and resources that you can read. Um, you, you know, at several so anointed for business, um, us human, uh, you, you know, uh, what's the title already? Change agents, change agents, sorry. And so quite a few, um, you know, apostles at the marketplace, Peter, and so many things that will help us, but I just want to quickly give you a, a little bit of foundation, then we want to talk about the differences and the sphere, okay? So of course, here in, the, in this house, we have a very specific assignment, right? We are, I mean, look at us, we are not quite the same as normal church, right? Because we have a very specific assignment to raise up marketplace, kingdom influencers, participants, whatever term you want to use, basically have something to do with marketplace. That's our key assignment, right? So of course, we want to talk quickly, what is marketplace? It's just a generic term we use, okay? Marketplace is not pasta, okay? It's, it's not you go and buy fish or veggie or whatever. And, but we, we describe society in general. Of course, some people use seven mountains, some people use uh, workplace, whatever term you want to use is fine. But more specifically, we are referring to, you know, people who are expert in Seven Mountain, they use the word culture molders. Basically, these are the places where they have the power to shape culture. So today, you look around, uh, you look at government, you look at media, you look at social media, you look at arts and entertainment, you look at sports. All these things have tremendous power to shape culture, right? And so what we're trying to say is that, look, these... These are the foundational bases that really, they have the power to shape and impact society. So if we want to change society, because you want a nation to become sheep, it has to be able to accept the Word of God. and It has to be able to facilitate the worship of God. So, so that's why it's very important we understand this. Then of course, the other thing about marketplace is, it's actually a harvest field. So I think a lot of people don't think of it in that sense. You go there, you, you are in a field, you are in a place where you can harvest, but you also have the harvest there. See, sometimes people kind of just think one or the other, oh, it's a harvest field or it's a harvest, but it's both. And by the way, harvest includes not just human souls, because souls is the basic of harvest, right? But you can also harvest culture, you can harvest nations, and you can harvest wealth. You know, when you study wealth, and, and you know, they start to talk about you have the new money and you have the old money. And, and if, you, if you know how to count old money, you put there, just accumulate the interest, compound interest, it's like crazy amount. So that's why this kind of thing can be harvest for kingdom. When you see Israel departed from Egypt, they had a transfer of wealth, right? A supernatural transfer of wealth. And later on, it was prophesied again that the next level of transfer will come from the Midianite. So, so that's why when Gideon, they all were having so much problem with the Midianite, it was an economic war. See, what we are facing right now in the world is really economic war. Because everyone is fighting for resources. You talk about the East and West, you talk about all the tension between China and the West and USA, it's all about resources. It's all about Everyone felt like there's no end. It's a bit like James 4, right? Why do you fight? Because you do not have what you do not. You do not have, you, you, you don't have what you want. That, that's the whole basis for war. All right, some more. So now we talk about marketplace church, right? Now, by the way, church, are we an organization? No, no, what are we? Are, are we human? <laughs> so, so what are we? I mean, of course, it's not a trick question, right? I mean, you know, the ecclesia, right? Ecclesia is gathering of believers, right? So we are talking about believers, you and me. We are the Marketplace Church. So what makes Marketplace Church, Marketplace Church is this thing. You are activated, you are equipped, because you can't go into Marketplace without an understanding how to do it, right? You are sent with apostolic authority into Marketplace. Then what is your purpose? Restoration. Because a lot of fighting, right? A lot of wounding, right? A lot of healing and deliverance needed in Marketplace, right? I mean, I just throw you to any sphere, you can see people are fighting all the time. And then some of us, is like we are, you know, 
you know, even in the legal world, some of us are not, you know, we are not the fighter type, we are the pro settlement. You know what is pro settlement? If we sit down, we, we don't want to fight, we want to deal. And, and lately I found out that wow, a lot of people don't really want that. They want to fight. So I have a, I, recently I have a case, and my client gave me the instruction, say, oh, agree already. Then the other, and then the other side is like, don't want to reply and keep messaging and say, I want to call. Then I say, I don't want to talk to you. You, 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 you let me know whether you accept it. If you not, you, 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 you counter. Because you, you see there are a lot of people just try to, they, they, they don't want to settle. They actually want to jeopardize the deal. So that's why we are sent for restoration because it is so needed in the world. Marketplace Church, we are prepared for kingdom contention. That means we are prepared for fight. You want to get... The, you want to have access into the marketplace, there, there will be fight, there will be battle, there will be things that people don't like about you. So now, of course, the mindset about going to marketplace, we are talking about our work, our service actually can be our ministry. So let's say you use your hands to do certain things, you serve, you write, you teach, you provide some kind of services, that thing you do, actually can be a kind of marketplace ministry. It can be, but it's not just limited to that. By the way, ministry and service, if you look at New Testament, both the word came from the Greek word, diakonia. So basically, it's ministry. Your acts of service is your ministry. So in the past, we used to say, oh, what ministry are you in? Oh, uh, I'm in marketplace. Then we're like, oh, marketplace is not ministry. Are you in usher? Are you in choir? Or oh, things like that. You, you know, the, the old church mindset is like that. But we are saying that, look, oops. We are saying that you can, oops, this pointer has a brain of its own. Okay, just give me a sec. Okay, so, 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 so basically what you do in the marketplace, it is considered ministry. Now, Ever since, of course, we talk about church history when the apostle and prophet, because when God finished the restoration of the fivefold, the pastors, then we have the we have uh, pastors first, of course, then we have a season of uh, evangelists. You know, there was a, the, the mega evangelists, television evangelists. Then we have teachers. The, the word of faith movement basically is a restoration of teacher. Then you have the prophets. Then you have the apostles. When the fivefold are complete, then God kind of moved the whole ecclesia into what Bishop Bill Hammond called the Saints Movement. It's basically marketplace movement. So we, we have seen an increasing focus. Every, I mean, you just look at every apostolic prophetic gathering, they will talk a little bit about marketplace, at least. But of course, here we are fully major on a marketplace. That, that's the difference, okay? So, so th this is happening already. It's nothing new. Now, before I, I talk about the, the house and marketplace dynamic, I just want to quickly show you why marketplace is important. This is a very quick one. Huh? Just for you to have a big picture, okay? Why it's important? Because that is the heartbeat of civilization, right? All, all the sphere, right? Government, education, etc., etc. It's, it's the heartbeat. The whole civilization runs on that. It is also the central place for movement of money. You, you know how important is money? Is money important? Yeah, I, I mean, money can, can really move mountain, right? And you know, recently, if you follow American political news, they just passed 1.2 trillion budget. 1.2 trillion, by the way, is only from now until September. These few months, they are using 1.2 trillion. It's really crazy, right? Um, so money really controls everything. Then, of course, this is what Apostle Peter went and said, three strongest things that impacted the history of the world. War, knowledge, and money. The greatest is money. That's why the Bible even have a verse, right? That money can solve every problem. And it's mostly true, okay? Then when we look at Jesus, right? Jesus came at the cross. He reversed the curse of work. Now, the curse of work came from where? Genesis, right? In the garden, right? So after, after man fell, God cursed the world and said, Adam, from now on, you have to toy. So, so when Jesus came, he reversed that. So that's why tomorrow is Monday, right? So how many of you have Monday blues and things like that, right? So, so by the way, if we... If we have Jesus, we are not under the curse of work. You shouldn't have Monday blue. I say shouldn't have, okay? But so, so sometimes it's the, the emotion part. It's not that way. Now that's why because the curse of work is removed, now work becomes the seed and foundation for discipling nation. That becomes the place, open doors. That becomes the place of favour. Now of course some of you are going to have 
direct access to fun, a lot of fun and things like that. But a lot of time, it's really, you know, just that favor God gives you and then God will open up certain doors. I'm talking about people who are mostly going to be involved in marketplace. But other people are more into the equipping. Then, of course, if you have success in marketplace, it will give people, God's people, unprecedented access. We look at Nehemiah, we look at Daniel, we look at Joseph. They all were successful, right? They all were faithful and suddenly God opened the door. So this is just a big picture kind of thing for us. Okay, for the rest of today, I really want to talk about the, the marketplace versus house. And I, I don't want you to have this kind of thinking that, oh, it's either here or there. I, I know in the last season, not even the last season, you know, every time we want to commission people, we'll ask you, right, what do you think is your involvement in marketplace? What do you think is your involvement in the house? We ask you the ratio, right? Now, actually, I think about it, ratio is not such a good concept, right? Because it makes you think, oh, is it 60-80%? Uh, 60-80, what kind of math? Is it 60-40? Is it 50-50? Yeah, that's why lawyers don't do math, okay? Um, so, so we think in those divisions, but it, it doesn't work like that, okay? But I would say this, that at any point in your life, God will, will kind of say, more marketplace or more house. And you can change, okay? So today is really for you to process it. Now, Marketplace Church, in the most technically accurate sense, we are referring to believers, okay? We already said that. We're not talking about organization. We have no legal entity and things like that. We're talking about people. So we are all Marketplace Church here, every one of us. And, and what makes us Marketplace? We are equipped and we sent, are sent into the sphere. Then what about the place? What about the house? Now, even when we talk about the house of equipping, we are not talking about organization. House also, people, right? It's also here, right? And by the way, today we suddenly say, oh, cannot use this place already. Let's meet in another place. Well, we're still a house of equipping. It's just in another place because what matters is the people. But you have people who are more doing the marketplace ministry and you have some people who are more into equipping. So we're talking about that difference. We're talking about that dynamic here. Now, the fivefold ministers, who are the fivefold ministers? You have the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They are specifically given the assignment to equip. And very interestingly, the Greek word equip, katatismos, means alignment. They do, they are, they equip who? The saints, right? How many saints? All the saints for the word of kingdom advancement. So we look at Ephesians 4, 12 to 13. It's a very familiar verse to many of you. So after Apostle Paul lists out the five four, then he said, what is the job? Their job is for the equipping of the saints. Katatismos, alignment. Katatismos is where you get the word chiropractor from. Align your bone. You know, so that you are, hopefully you, are, you have a straight back, right? Then, for what? Work of service? For the building of the body of Christ? So you can see already, it's for work of service inside and outside of the house. Until, until when? We all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the fullness of Christ. So you know fullness of Christ basically is like until the second coming of Jesus. So this is going to go on forever and ever until God, Jesus decided to come and reset the world, okay? So, that's why this is forever. And for people who say, oh, the apostles have died, the prophets have died, some don't even accept uh, evangelists and, uh, and teachers, just show them this verse, okay? Start with verse 11. Okay, so here we begin to see there is a difference. Look at your neighbor and say, there is a difference. There is a difference. You have people who equip, you have people who are the saints. They, they go into the marketplace. And of course, we also have the hybrid. And... The problem is really, sometimes we are like, oh, we, I'm all three, so I don't want to think. No, you have to think where you, your gift has most impact. Because you, let's say you have gift in both. You are both an equipper and a saint. Then the question to ask is, which of my gift has kingdom level? Because some of you give maybe only personal level. So this is something to think about. Now, the ministry of Apostle Peter really demonstrated the equipping edge particularly within the house. I want to emphasize again, when we talk about house, we're not talking about organization. We are still talking about people, right? Still the people of God. Just, a collect, just they focus more for equipping. So one of the verse, of course, Acts 6, 4, 
Now this is, of course, when the apostles were overwhelmed and they decided to appoint the deacon, right? The seven, right? And, and he said, and then after that, Peter concluded, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of work. So basically, you all do the ministry. I'm just going to teach and do some sensing. That's it. That's what he said. And, and that's the thing that, you know, sometimes when we look at the history of the pastoral model, the senior pastor is not supposed to do all the ministry. It's like they do house visitation for everyone and then if you're the member and the senior pastor doesn't visit you this year, then you show the black face, right? <laughs> I mean, if you're in that kind of model, it's a wrong model. So Peter allowed others to do the ministry. Actually, this is really a motto for me. <laughs> because I do that a lot. And, and it's, it's, not that, it's not I don't want to do ministry or anything. Actually, when I was a student, I really do a lot of ministry. You'll be surprised to hear that. <laughs> if you look at me now. But it's really, I don't know, at some point I just felt like, hey, that's not my job. And of course, I can give input and things like that. So that's part of the process that we're going into. We become more and more specific in what we do. And it's just like, you know, some, some people maybe in the prophetic team you used to prophesy more and, and then you prophesy less, but you are helping the team to grow. So, so that kind of advancement. And he focused on teaching and hearing the voice of God. Then the second time happened that shows his equipping edge and his commitment to house. Acts 8. Acts 8, of course, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. What happened? Saul came, right? Killed Stephen and persecution came. By the way, do you know why it happened? Because the church became so comfortable in Jerusalem, they don't want to go out. God forced a scattering. So this is really, when I think about it, it's really like in this country, right, in Malaysia, right, some of us are avoiding certain area. Some of us are avoiding certain ministry. But I tell you, if we continue to do that, God will kind of move us there, one way or another. So that's why I scattered where? Judea and Samaria. Everyone ran away except the apostles. Why? They had to stay in the house. See, Marketplace people, of course, you can kind of relocate and things like that. But if you're equipping, you stay within the equipping realm. So you see his commitment. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that Peter doesn't have any marketplace edge. I mean, he was a fisherman. He was marketplace. He, he, he kind of dealt with colonials. He did, dealt with Gamaliel. And, and so he had a lot of encounter. But what we're trying to say is that his primary strength is equipping and within the house. That's really him. So he remained in Jerusalem. So his ministry, basically, if you have a calling of Peter, you are more equipping, you are more in the house. Then, of course, later on in the book of Acts, we saw a new breed of apostles. They start to demonstrate marketplace edge. Now, that, that itself, of course, we talk about Ephesus Apostolic Center. It can be a teaching by itself. But I just want to show you one verse, right? At some point in Corinth, so Corinth, of course, is a very interesting place because Paul suddenly met another marketplace people. Acts 18, 2 to 3. And he, he refers to Apostle Paul, found a Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla. He came to them. Very interesting. I always find this interesting that Paul went to them. And because he was on the same trade, it's like, at what point did he start working? We don't even know. And he stayed with them and they were working for by trade, they were tent makers. Very interesting, right? I mean, we, we know he was a zealot. We know he was from religion mountain. He was like the, the most promising of the Pharisee. And then he was in Arabia with Peter for many, many years. He was in church of Antioch. And suddenly, when did he work? At some point, he, he became a marketplace minister. Now, if we move back a little bit, Acts 13, 1, and this was his commissioning. Now, at Antioch in the church was there. Prophets and teachers, Barnabas and so. So, what we wanted to say is, look, in Acts 13, he started off mainly as a five-four minister within the house context, Antioch. Now, when you read Acts 13, 1, you know what that means or not? Now, at Antioch in the house, there was their prophets, teachers, then they named Barnabas, so, and three other persons. What this means was that Barnabas and so were already prophets or teachers. And now God say, I'm going to... So, so one of the things that if you want to have apostle in any area, whether it's a marketplace or in a religious mountain, it's the same. You need to have teachers and prophets first. Then, then you can facilitate the gift. 
Now, of course, when you look at Antioch, now this one maybe we'll do another time. Acts 31 is very, very interesting because the five names, name, they are all not from Antioch. And this is one of the most interesting things. That means they, they were apostolic teams from all over the place. So, so this is the kind of model that we are doing right now. You see, I mean, look at this. How, of course, we have a lot of local here, right? I think more than half of us are not local, right? <laughs> we are not from here, right? We are we're kind of transplanted here, right? Um, so it's a bit like Antioch. This is like Antioch. And when Paul and Barnabas were commissioned, the five names mentioned, none of them were from Antioch. Okay, but that may be in part three. So anyway, at some point, look at your neighbor and say, at some point. Paul became directly involved in marketplace equipping. He equipped marketplace people, but then he himself also a minister, right? Ten maker. So I think you look at, I think we are all marketplace ministers, right? Are we? Any full-time pastor here? No, nobody, right? Okay. So, but we are, we are all marketplace ministers, but how many of us are more into equipping? See, that's the question I'm asking today. That's the question I'm challenging people to think about. Because some of you, your gift is really more to raise up. Your gift is more towards the 5 four. Now, of course, I heard many 5 four ministers, they also do ministry. And you know what is the main motivation for doing ministry? Like, like we, we all do ministry, right? We, we all have marketplace. The main motivation is really so that they can understand marketplace, so that they can demonstrate a model, but they may not be the one with the strongest edge in marketplace. You understand what I'm trying to say now? Whereas in the past season, you have the pastoral model, you have the seminary trained pastors, they have no contact with marketplace at all. Then whatever they teach and impart, it's like there's a disconnect, right? Have you been in churches where they try to teach marketplace and the only thing they will say is, oh, you all go there, earn money and bring it back to the church. That's the end of teaching. I mean, it, it, a, lot of people, a lot of marketplace people felt insulted with this kind of teaching. So for, for us, I, I mean, I would say personally, I'm probably more into the equipping side than direct minister, even though I'm a marketplace person. But is that really the, the main thing? So it's an evolving question for a lot of us. All right, some more. So I already kind of say a bit, but here's the question for you to consider. Is there a difference between marketplace equipping and direct marketplace minister? Is there a difference? Yes, yes. I mean, I already told you, right? <laughs> yes. So, so it's not a trick question, right? Um, so, so again, we go back. The five, four ministers, that's why if you have stronger edge in this area. Now, of course, you can have five, four ministers who are more direct marketplace ministers. You can. But if you are like this, you, you are more into the overall equipping of the saints. Now, it could be in the house and it could be in the marketplace. And that was a question more than 10 years ago. I asked the the. I asked the, the religion mountain apostles, will it come a day where even the marketplace equipping come from marketplace people directly? Actually, it's already happening, right? We, we are already fooling marketplace people. But the question is really the degree, how much you do. You see, some 5 four ministers and like the ones in, our, in this house, because that's what we've been called, we are giving more specific assignment to equip marketplace ministers who will operate in several months. I mean, that's what we do, right? We, we teach people to kind of operate in marketplace. But some of your gift is for the house. We also equip saints whose gift might be used in the house. Correct or not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. And I think sometimes people kind of get confused and say, oh, everything is for... I mean, we tend to go extreme, you know. In the past, we'll be like, oh, all the gift is for the house. That's the old model. Then the new model, oh, everything is outside marketplace. No need to do anything for the house. Nobody in the house, how to equip? In one or two generations, everything will die. You, you, you know where I'm trying to come from or not? So, so that's why you, you have to ask yourself. I'm, I'm not saying, even if at this point you're not sure, you say, oh, 50-50. It's okay. If you say 50-50, I, I, I won't, we won't be scolding you. But we are just saying that you have to start thinking. Okay? Of course, then we have a third one, hybrid. So a lot of people raise it. Oh, I'm hybrid, I'm hybrid. <laughs> but even then, I, I, I really believe every season is different. You have to ask God. If you are an equipper, don't be afraid to be an equipper. Is, is it in the past, everyone wants to be 5-4, right? Oh, that, that's... I know this is a subconscious thing, the, the Confucius subconscious thing. Oh, 5-4 is superior, we all want to be that. Then when people hear, oh, marketplace is more superior, oh, we all want to be marketplace, nobody wants to equip. You see, we are very extreme because of our culture and things like that. But, but think about it, okay? 
Okay, some more. Why is it important? Okay, so now we, are, we talk about the, the reason. Why is it important to differentiate the kind of ministry, whether you are marketplace minister or whether you are equipping minister? Why is it important? Because it relates to sphere. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a sphere. Yeah. And now, by the way, why sphere is so important? Because if you don't operate within your sphere, you don't get your reward. If God say you are in marketplace, you have to earn a lot of money, and then you say, no, 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 I want to be a pastor, I want to be a teacher, I want to equip, I want to say, yeah, I don't want to go out at all. Then God will be like, well, well, well. You did fine, but not good enough. And, and you, you know, this is the thing that is happening, that we want to make sure we're in the right place. And that's why you have to look at your redemptive prophecy. I, I mean, I am so, you know, we review redemptive prophecy from time to time. <laughs> Sometimes we don't tell you that, but what you say and what is written there is totally not the same. Then we'll ask you, did you believe in the redemptive prophecy? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe, I believe. Then why the things you say totally not the same? Because sometimes people, somebody come here and say, marketplace, marketplace, and they say, oh, I'm not in marketplace. You, you see, there is a bit of double-mindedness out there. Now, we haven't really challenged people very directly, but we're going to do it soon, okay? Um, no, not say soon. If you want, if you're not sure and you want to advance, you have to be sure. And I'm not saying that you, you're stuck in one area forever. God can move you from one dimension to another dimension. Many people in this house, we have an edge, right, in both. And it's true. I, I think that's one of the pioneering uh, aspects of this house, that a lot of us have both. And you all tried before, but at some point, I really believe God will show you which one you are more gifted and which one you should be focusing more. House ministry or marketplace ministry? Now, if you... House ministry, of course, we're talking about equipping, okay? So through activation of redemptive prophecy, which is the theme of this series, a person, we can begin the journey, right? And... and the process of narrowing down, we become more and more focused. That's why I say at six really become uh, the verse for me. It, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not so bothered about ministry and things like that because I know there are people who are more gifted than me to do ministry. I, I just focus on teaching. I just focus on, on, on sensing and things like that. So, so that's okay because you, you, you go through the whole process of narrowing down. So then again, we see the cooperative nature. We need to cooperate with Holy Spirit and then we start to develop a corporate mindset because you move beyond yourself. You see, if you remain stuck in personal level, all these things cannot happen because you're always thinking about what's best for me, what's best for my bank account, what's best for my rest. Oh, today, the, the, my, my watch today, my, my sleep score is 51. <laughs> Talk about sleep at 10 p.m., right? You see, the other, the other week, we, we, we went to Cameron for two nights. Right? What, so, so I think... I think it's the first time I get 99 score for sleep. Never happened before. Actually, it's very nice to sleep in Cameron because it's cooler and things like that. So, so some of you really need to take time to be awake so that you are not like so tired and things like that. So if people tell you, you look very tired, you, you, you better kind of reconsider what you're doing, okay? So that's why God gives us Shabbat. And by the way, you know Shabbat is... Very free. It's very flexible. There's no legalism in that. So you, but you, you, but if you try to sneak some words, then it's not Shabbat, okay? So anyway, when we do that, we continue to co cooperate with God. We continue to develop a corporate mindset. Corporate mindset meaning we move together for the kingdom of God. Eventually, we reach the stage of convergence, ultimate gift expression. Now, some people ask, you know, are there books on converge convergence? Actually, many books, okay? One, of course, by one of the fuller professor, uh, Robert Clinton, convergence. Then, of course, the late apostle Peter Werner, after he passed on, he had a bit of notes, the wife kind of uh, put together and I, into a very small booklet called uh, A Fruitful Life, right? I think white color one, we have a few copies. And there's one chapter on convergence. That, that's probably very easy to read if, if you want to know the process. Okay, some more. So, the whole process of convergence, going into our strongest area, it requires us to look at a few things. What is our most fruitful? That means when you do something, it's great. So let's say you think you are an evangelist and you go out and share, promote a time to succeed. After doing that for a few years, nobody joined. <laughs> maybe, maybe you, don't, you are not an evangelist. Maybe. I, I'm not saying yes or no. I, I'm saying maybe. 
And when you do that, it's like, oh, Pastor Joyce say, go, go and promote, go and promote. And you're like, oh, not again, not again, not again. It's not fulfilled. It's not, there's no fulfillment. Oh, join the prophetic team. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want, to, I want to find, to escape. So, so you, you know when you respond, now, of course, if you don't like it or you, you can't do it, it, it could be, yes, maybe there's some deliverance needed, maybe some healing needed, but these are signs that maybe it is not your assignment. Maybe it is not your sphere. So you have to think about that properly. Then, of course, we already talked about the level, right? Personal, tribe, kingdom. Which one really is your strongest one? Are you demonstrating higher level fruits in the house or marketplace? And it's not easy to ask because some people will, oh, actually, I have no fruits anywhere. <laughs> it's okay, you know, or, or, or it's like I don't have a lot of fruits. It, it's okay, but try to see where you are most fruitful. And sometimes you have to ask someone to give you feedback. That's where mentoring is very important. The last track advancement, uh, advancing school, we have a few people come out and share mentoring experience and, and that's really worth watching also. Uh, actually, I, I wasn't here, but later I watched and all, all the people who have gone through the process, they really share some good points. And it's the process and you see, oh, they're a bit different. Oh, they have certain misconception, but they, they were able to overcome it. So I, I encourage you to watch that and it, it's something you have to ask yourself. Where do you experience greater level of resistance and warfare? Now, if you try to do something and it's not happening and it's not because of your laziness and lack of initiative, but it's because of spiritual warfare, then maybe that is also your area of gifting because the enemy will want to stop you. Okay, see, these are a few things to think about. What, else? what more? Well, here's a question. Is it possible to be a full-time marketplace person? Okay, what do we mean by that? That means you work there, you work nine to five, you have your own business and things like that. Is it possible that you are that kind of category yet your strongest gifting is actually for house? Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully you, you, you get what I'm trying to say already. So it is possible. And it is like maybe, you know, you work there, you have a business, you, you are able to support your family and things like that. You have a comfortable life. Many years ago, one of the marketplace minister, uh, I think Rich Marshall, he came to Cebu. And he, uh, you see, that's the thing. When we start to teach about this kind of thing, everyone go into one side and say, oh, we all want to become marketplace. But who, who is in the house? But he said something very interesting that I always was reminded. He said, look, if, if you are motivated by money to, to help your family, and he said it's not a wrong thing. It's not wrong to say you want to have enough so that you and your family are comfortable. It's not wrong enough. It's not wrong. But then he said, you need to think of a number that you are comfortable with. Because once you reach that number, you, you shouldn't pursue it anymore. So for, for him, he, he only kept 90%. He only kept 10% of his income. And he said, well, you, you have to kind of talk to God and set a number. How much you want? You want... 100,000 per month, you want 200,000 per month, you want 1 million per month, you want 2 million per month. That, that's up to you. And he said, ask for a big number. Well, he said, well, because once you reach that number, the wealth doesn't motivate you in terms of personal level. But it can still motivate you for kingdom level. So some people want to be rich because they want to bless the kingdom. That's different. Then you should go and earn your billions and trillions. So you say, well, even if you say you just keep 10%, you can still have your Lamborghini or whatever. Yeah. It, well, why, must, why must you think poor? So that's why it, this is a question that you have to ask. Is it possible? Then, of course, the other side is also possible, right? It is also possible that your strongest edge might be in the marketplace. That means you are a marketplace person and, and then your, your main focus is actually doing the work. There's not so much in equipping in the house. It's quite possible. This, that, so this is the two possible option. Now, one of the things that I want to show you is, is this marketplace versus house matrix. Um, we, we kind of show this in our governmental micro church, basically just to help people to see where, where, what you can be. Okay, so matrix basically show the kind of role, and, and so we say, let's say you're involved in marketplace. Um, so this is an uh, example of uh, government. Okay, so if you have direct involvement in government. What kind of job you can be? You can be a ruler, right? You can be a president, right? Prime minister, you can be a... Well, I don't think you can be Argon, but... <laughs> I don't know, in future, maybe they, they vote the key. Well, you can be lawmaker, go to parliament, go to Adun. 
You can be administrator. Now, by the way, in Malaysia, you, you know some administrators are more powerful than ministers. If you're chief secretary, chief secretary in Malaysia government is very, very powerful. Um, then, of course, you could be supportive. Still in mar direct marketplace, you could be supportive. You could be chief of staff. That means, you know, chief of staff, basically, you support the politician, the leader. You don't show your face, but sometimes this person is the most powerful. Right? You can be senior advisor. Then, of course, you could be from other mountain. Maybe you get, you're an expert in business. You're an expert in religion. Remember Ramiro? Some of you know Ramiro, right? Ramiro was from religion mountain, but he became advisor to Trump, for example. So he's across seven mountains. But then you could be involved. You could be involved in marketplace through the house. So this is talking about the house. So you you are the five four equipper. You could be intercessor. Now, by the way, intercessors are so important, right? And you could be connector. So you start to see that. Look, you can start in the house. Maybe that's your focus. Some of you have more marketplace. Now, this is not a progression. This is this. The last one is just the option. You could be there. You, be, you could be in marketplace. Then, of course, you could be hybrid, both. And, and finally, some of you will have involvement in several mountains. So this is just to help you to think that where you are. Because if you look at it, you say, "Oh, I, I think I'm more equipper. I think I'm more intercessor." By the way, if you're intercessor, you you could be intercessor outside the mountain, right? You're not involved at all. And sometimes it's very helpful. And sometimes you are someone directly, let's say you are in bank, you are in technology, and you are also intercessor, then you are really in a direct kind of line. So all these things will help you to kind of narrow down, are you more in the marketplace or are you more in the house? All right, a few things I want to say, um, just kind of to wrap up already. Do not be overly concerned over the ratio. That's why as I think about it, I think ratio is a very unhelpful term. So don't think about the ratio. The important thing to know is that your part, what is your particular focus within this season? Five, seven, eight, four pass over. What, what do you think? Do you think God wants you to focus more house? And, and you have to look at the gift because many of you, when I look down, you can do well in both. Actually, many of you, that, that's very true. But I, I think there is a focus that God will show you. Understand that our roles can shift and change from season to season. So, for example, look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was fully marketplace, right? He was a cup bearer for 12 years. Then suddenly, God gave him an assignment to build the, the wall. And he, he continued to stay in Jerusalem for the next 12 years. And he became hybrid. And actually, his hybrid is more marketplace because he was dealing with political, government, social issue. And, and some more, remember, later on, remember, he even had direct dealing with the temple. He was kicking out the relative of the high priest. Then look at Paul. Paul is the other side. Paul started off fully as house minister, right? So remember, he was the zealot of the zealot. He was a Pharisee. Then, then after his encounter, he tried to do ministry and he was killed. Then, then he was rescued by Barnabas. For the next 10 years, he was in Arabia. Then he became a, a 5-4 in Antioch. So he was always fully housed. And then suddenly, he moved into marketplace equipping. Look at Ephesus. He went to Ephesus, Acts 19, and he went to the synagogue. They all rejected him. Then he decided to rent a place, uh, the whole of Tyrannus, and he was teaching there for three years. That's marketplace equipping, right? It's like you go to the church. They all don't want you. Okay, lah, I just rent a building. I'm going to do my charama there. And he did that for three years. And then you see in chapter, the whole region of Asia Minor was shifted through marketplace equipment. Then he himself, at some point, we don't know when, become a tent maker. And I, I think it's the progression is like this. Well, I'm away already. I, I need to self-finance. That's why when he wrote to the Corinth, he said, well, a minister is entitled to eat from the fund of the gospel. And he said that, you know, actually he was talking about himself. <laughs> but actually, he said, I don't need your money because I can earn my own money. This kind of reminds me of my, my, my father when he went to Cambodia. So they're both retired already at that time. And you know, when you want to go through mission agency, then they will try to say, oh, you can get this much, this much. You know, some mission agency, they don't even give you enough to survive. This is a fact. Not, not criticizing them or anything. But then when he decided to go there for five years, he kind of allocated enough living expenses for five years. <laughs> and when you do that, you are not under the control. And I'm not saying everyone is to do that, but look at Apostle Paul. He was financially independent. Because that's one of the benefits. So it could be 
that you are a marketplace minister simply because you want to be financially independent and nothing more. And that's not your strongest area. Your strongest area is actually house equipping. I personally feel I'm leaning towards that. That my role in marketplace minister, yeah, I mean, I have some influence and things like that, but really, I want to be financially independent. But that can change. Okay, so, so do think about it. Okay, now the last part, and, and, and we, we talk about this because in terms of intercession, in terms of uh, the dynamic, you know, we have authority structure. You know, whether we're in the house or marketplace, we need to identify this person called principal, okay? Now, some of you have been involved with our prayer move, uh, with our spiritual warfare assignment. Now, we have nation watch training and things like that. So, this is just something that helps us to think about how we can operate within the sphere. Now, this is a very introductory. We're not going very deep inside See, principle is basically this, the one with authority over your spheres, assignments, and gifts. By the way, principle applies both in the house and marketplace. You can have principles who are fully unbeliever. Well, look at Malaysia, right? Who has the greatest authority in this land? It's our Prime Minister, right? So, so he is a principle over many areas of this nation. So when we operate within those areas, we are blessed. See, principle... Even principal himself or herself, they have a sphere. They have a limit. They can only operate within it. So that's why if we talk about marketplace and house, some principal work within the house sphere. So they only have authority here. Some people work in the marketplace. Then they have the, the, the influence there. Then you start to see people like Wilberforce and things like that. They, they have a bit of hybrid. Look at Nehemiah. Started off getting the authority from the king of Persia, but towards the end, because of his partnership with Ezra, he was able to have even influence and authority over the temple management. You see how it changed? So we already say both house and marketplace, you have that. And how you can have, so principle, what was the thing that you can benefit? You want to get the benefit from them, whether believer or unbeliever is the same. Mentoring, alignment, whether it's remote or casual, you, you will get benefit from them. By the way, do you know you can have mentoring and alignment with uh, unbeliever, they will help you to prosper in your sphere. But of course, you want to be very careful that you, you, you don't compromise because some of the principle will force you to violate your conscience or the word of God. And that is when you have to consider this alignment. But anyway, the last point about this is when you respect the authority of the principle. And I, I immediately think about David and Saul, right? So remember Saul rule for 40 years? And even when he was just 30, uh, when, when he was in the, in the rain, less than five or six years, I, I think less than 10 years, God already kind of judged him and removed him and anointed David, right? But he was still king, right? So sometimes God can decide, I'm going to take you away. But yeah, there's a process and David refused to operate outside that sphere. He refused to say, that, oh, God already declared, I'm going to kill you and things like that. No, he refused to do that. And, and, and that's why, here's the thing about principle. You let God deal with the principle. It, it's not your job. If your principle are evil, two options, two options. One, you run away. David ran away, right? So David didn't stay there and get killed. Remember, so through the sphere at him three times, and he decided enough is enough. So is it okay to run? Is it okay to resign? Yeah, don't be stupid and, and stay there and continue to get abused and things like that. But of course, sometimes, you, you, you know, you, you have seen Daniel doesn't run away and things like that. It's revelation. It's personal revelation. But as long as you operate within this, you will prosper. You will set yourself up for promotion. All right, finishing already. So, so the last part I want to talk about, and just some example, look, look at Israel, right? Look at Israel. They, they, they were supposed to go into promised land and then they go into wilderness and things like that. And, and we saw the different leadership actually show the different edge, right? So the first leadership, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, basically they are the house, right? Moses is what? Moses is a CEO and also pastor, okay? Aaron is what? Priest, prophet. Actually not prophet, Moses is prophet. Miriam, Miriam is a worship leader, right? Judah. So they represent the house. They have all the gifts necessary and very interesting because, I, I, you know, some people describe the house of Israel went into Egypt. When, when they came out, 
with 3 million plus people, you know what? They are still a house of Hebrew. They have not become a nation of Israel. Because they are still very much like, oh, what is my knee and things like that, right? You know, their, their elders, I mean, they still behave like a, a big family, just a 3 million strong family. But then the team, the house team is needed for them to become a nation. And that's what they did, right? They did many, many things. Then, look at what are the things that you do in house. Deliverance, healing, pastoral, organization of army, warfare. By the way, you learn warfare in house. You, you learn warfare in your family. Family is the first war unit. Praise and worship, priestly dimension. Priestly meaning you are able to bring something to God. That's priestly. You see, a lot, a lot of people don't understand what is the purpose of priest. Priest is to bring problem. Priest is really like a kind of intercessor. You look at what's happening. It's like, God, did you see what's happening or not? Are you able to do something? Of course, God is able, but that's what you do. You present to heaven. The prophetic dimension here in the verse. These are all the house. So, so you look at it. It's house important. You see, without Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, there is no possession of promised land. Some people try to discredit the OZ, these old leaders. No, without the house leadership, there is no this uh, taking over of Canaan. Then, of course, after Meribah, right, the second incident with water, the Lord began leadership transition to Joshua. And Joshua represents the marketplace edge. That's why you look at Joshua. Was he ever involved with old housing? He wasn't involved with the building of the tabernacle. He wasn't involved with Aaron Priestley's stuff. He wasn't involved with Miriam's worship. And the only thing that we, we read about him was, well, when Moses went out to take the tablet, he said half mountain. And the next thing we saw about him is they were in that two years and he was leading the army. That's it. So that's why he was really not in the house. And, and we heard about him just a little bit. See, Joshua, what was his transition? That 22 months from Meribah to Jordan, suddenly he was upgraded. That's why when you want to help people in marketplace, you need to help them in the transition. So the transition actually is helped by the house. Do you realize that? Aaron, Aaron died already. Uh, Miriam died already. But Moses continued to live for 22 months to help the transition. So that was the time they fought uh, Sidon, right? That was the time they fought um, Balaam, all those people. It, it's a high-level enemy because Joshua needed to learn. There was a shift from striking, you know, hit the rock. Now you speak to the rock. And, and you know, we are shifting from eyeing to, to pay, right? Eyeing is that like we see a lot of things. Now it's like, yes, it's important to see, but it's more important to speak. It's more important to declare. So that's why this is a higher level. And, and God kind of demonstrated that at Meribah and Israel finally say, well, we, we accept. Then Joshua began a season of possessions and occupation. 40 years captured much of Canaan. This is really marketplace, right? See, that's why when we talk about possession, we talk about occupation. You, you can't do that with house anointing. House anointing is to equip and then the marketplace people need to go and do it. The marketplace people need to go and change education. And that's why yesterday somebody was just asking me, you know, look, look at all this KKMA thing. They, they, they say, is it a religious or... A, a racial thing. I, I say, actually, I, you know, I, I say it's a political thing because the political spirit uses race and religion to divide and conquer. And, and, and we, we can see already. That that's why after all this cycle, right, I mean, we look at green wave and past and things like that. Hey, at the end of the day, it, it, it's those people abusing the, the political spirit that we have to be very, very wary of. And you know who, I don't need to say who. It's very obvious who are playing the political game. Joshua, his leadership demanded the people of God because they are now possession. See, when you go into marketplace, your posture change. You have to look beyond the house. See, this is one of the problems with the, with the old pastoral. They can't look beyond the house. They want to do social work. They want to feed the poor. They want to do soup kitchen. They want to do whatever, but they want to do it like the house is in control. The house is in control. But you see, look at Joshua. When he was fighting for 40 years, do you realize that they don't have a house? Yes, they have a tabernacle, but they never built... You know, Joshua never built a temple. He never established a permanent house. And by the time they finished, the closest thing was Shiloh. Shiloh was not a permanent structure. It's just some tent, build some fire, okay? All right, all right, you all have your things already. Bye-bye, see you next year. See you. And, and the next thing is... And, and you know, the tribe start to do their own thing. And, and 
they, 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 will, they will have different judges and things like that for the next 400 years before Solomon will build the temple. So, so this is the thing that, that we have to understand that once we go into house, it's very, very different already. And some of you are called to be Joshua. You are to go into the different area, possess and occupy. All right, I think this is the last slide already. Um, last one, hybrid. Now, I talked about hybrid uh, last year, Feast of Tabernacle. Uh, if you want to, to watch those teaching, you, you can wa just watch it. So I just want to give you some characteristics of hybrid, okay? Nehemiah kind of showed that he, he, he was a hybrid person. And seven things that he did. Just very quickly, this is for, for, for completion of this part uh, that, that we, we all know what's happening. So he was intercessor, you know, talk about Nehemiah. Maybe possibly a national level. He was a high-level prophetic minister. So it's like, you want to be hybrid, you kind of have to show both the house and marketplace anointing. You need to have both. What else? He can solve generational systemic problem. This is not house anointing, right? This is more marketplace anointing. He had that marketplace anointing. He was highly attuned to the voice of God. Whether you are in house or outside, you need to hear the voice of God very well. He was rich and not afraid to use it. He partners with those with anointing. So one of the things about um, the, the, if you want to be hybrid, is you really look at the anointing and, and you let the anointing rise. And finally, he stepped into the hybrid anointing, having authority even over temple matters. That, that was the most surprising thing. So I want to finish off and then we're going to get a team to come out. And if you, if you feel like you have redemptive prophecy, or even if you don't have redemptive prophecy, I, I think we can give redemptive prophecy, right? So you don't have, first, you don't have redemptive prophecy, you want it, the team will give to you. Secondly, you have it and you felt like you're stuck and things like that. Um, I think the team can minister to you. The team, team can re-prophesy maybe. I, I don't know if they're able to do that without any notes and things like that. But just, just look at what, what you want to do, okay? Then, of course, the rest of you, 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 know, you, you feel, feel free to do other things. But really, today, you felt like you're, you're not sure, you know. It's like the marketplace or the equipping, you, you are really don't know where you are. So that's why I want to end with these questions. What is your edge? What are you strong with? Where do you stand today? Are, are you sure you are more here, more there, or you are just like a, a big blur over you? So that's why we want to, each of us, uh, us, we should begin to ask the Lord to show us, okay? So Lord, I just pray right now, you cause us to have an understanding. And it's not like we have to be in a precise allocation. I, I heard the Lord say, look, I, I'm not asking you to be super precise right now, but it's like there is a process. There is a dimension of going into more marketplace or more equipping. And it's like there is a trend, there is a flow, there is a directional push that the Lord said, I'm going to cause you to look at one side so that you know it is for this season. And so it's like I heard the Lord say that some of you, you just have to come and be activated today so that whatever that has been prophesied will take a foothold in your life in this season and you will experience a great passing over in this cycle. So we declare that this will happen to many of us in Jesus' name. Amen.